to get started back. Uh, we have two more presentations uh, for this, this afternoon session. Uh, next up is myself, uh, I'm David Stargell. I'm also a program officer within the Dynamical Systems and Control Group. Uh, I run the multi-scale structural mechanics, um, uh, multi-scale structural mechanics and prognosis uh, program. All right, so when I, when I go out and talk about uh, my portfolio, uh, and we, we talk about what structural mechanics problems are relevant to the Air Force, uh, and we, we try to understand what areas of, of research are we trying to address, uh, we really talk about looking at computation of deformations, deflections, forces and stresses to include damage um, for, for structures either for the design or performance evaluation of, of existing structures. Uh, and we have three sub areas within the portfolio. We do novel flight structures, multi-scale modeling prognosis, and structural dynamics. Uh, and the, the easy way to remember what, how we actually apply or what we look to accomplish within the, in the portfolio, we look at computing, predicting, and enabling. Those are our three key areas that we try to accomplish within the structural mechanics portfolio. So we, we've, we've shown these uh, before, but these are our three thrust areas. Uh, so if you've seen this, you've seen it before. So in novel flight structures, we really talked about morphing aircraft, flapping wing uh, type vehicles, and non-traditional structural configurations. Uh, under the multi-scale modeling prognosis, that's where we have most of our structural health monitoring, non-destructive evaluation, uh, prognosis, and a lot of the physics-based modeling um, for, for our area. And then in the structural dynamics, we're really talking about combined environments, thermoacoustic response, mechanical uh, included in there, and also the work that we're doing with space, a lot of our space structure work as well. The challenges um, haven't changed over, over the last couple of years. The challenges are still there. These aren't necessarily all basic research challenges, but these are some of the challenges that we are putting forward for our community to address. And the novel flight structures um, arena, we're really talking about multidisciplinary design problems. Uh, we, we, we've had a shift from, you know, traditionally, our communities have been very good at doing design. Now we're getting into to the, the, the performance limits where we have to take into account the multidisciplinary nature of the design aspects in order to get the capability out of the structures that we really need. So not just doing a single thermal analysis and then a mechanical analysis and then an acoustic analysis, but really combining all of these things so that they work synergistically. Um, and then we're also dealing with a lot more non-traditional structural configurations. I love the, the picture that Mike Kendra showed earlier with his uh, flapping wing with the, the stores on them. That's actually what we're trying to do in some of our, our portfolio. We actually want to be able to achieve some type of, of thrusting capability um, in, these, in these morphing type vehicles through the, through the wing structures. Uh, we're also doing a, big, a lot of stuff right now with student education. Uh, and that's, that's really key when we talk about you know, getting into non-traditional structural configurations and multidisciplinary design. Um, the, the historical uh, educational um, aspects of, of, of aerospace, mechanical engineering, um, haven't had a lot of focus on multidisciplinary design. And we're seeing that come out a lot more now you know, as, as people transition into the workforce. Uh, the, the industry folks are asking for these engineers to come out and have that capability to do multidisciplinary design. So we've got two new areas uh, that we're doing in terms of student education. Uh, one uh, is a, a student design capstone project out of University of Washington. Uh, in collaboration with our, our folks at the um, AFRL RQ, the Aerospace Systems uh, Group. And what they're looking at is trying to uh, teach the, how, how, what do they have to change in the design um, education aspects for um, what they're doing is a, a tailless supersonic jet is what they're, what they're using. So having to understand what the control mechanisms and the structural configurations, all those things have to go into design. So that's a, a pretty novel uh, capstone challenge for the students to look at, at design education. The second one that's, uh, that's really hot off the presses and we're, we're going to be kicking off here uh, in March and April is a collaboration with Virginia Tech on the additive manufacturing side. Um, we, we've seen a, a big push in the past couple of years on the additive manufacturing across the national scale. Um, and what we're really looking at now is to push the students into understanding what are the design requirements for additive manufacturing. So they'll be going through a, a capstone, a challenge project. Um, it's a collaboration between uh, all of the DOD uh, forces, so Air Force, Army, Navy, NASA's involved, 
Um, and, and they're going to be doing a, a challenge project to, to look at design of some uh, ground vehicles and some air vehicles, and they'll do some, some challenges in terms of how they can apply additive manufacturing to meet some of the requirements that, that we need for, for innovative manufacturing capability in the future. Um, other areas, challenges, and uh, the multi and we've heard this, we heard this from Fariba's talk earlier, um, uncertainty quantification, uh, variability, um, you know, really getting into not the deterministic type analysis, but getting into stochastic analysis. Uh, probability of detection is a big area in terms of non-destructive evaluation and structural health monitoring. Uh, and she also talked about verification and validation. As we move more into this computational framework, we really have to have uh, a better understanding of how we verify and validate these models uh, before we actually put them into use. Uh, and then uh, as we get into multi-scale aspects, we really talk about time and length, length scales couplings. That's another big challenge area. Uh, on the structural dynamics side, uh, and this actually is, is cross-cutting, is computational cost. Uh, we'll, we'll hear a lot of that throughout this week. Uh, we heard Mike talk a little bit about the neuromorphic computing. Uh, we've got some other, other PMs, POs within AFOSR that are looking at transformational computing opportunities, looking at quantum computing, uh, neuromorphic computing, bio, uh, optical. There's a, there's a big push right now to, to understand how we can reduce the computational cost of these, these high, high fidelity simulations that we're doing. Uh, and then as we move into some of the combined environments, really trying to understand how we can exploit the nonlinear interactions and how we can understand um, these nonlinear systems so that we can design um, at a higher, higher, um, higher fidelity level. And then uh, we heard from Mike talking about testing environments. That's, that's another big thing. Test, test evaluation is key, even in my portfolio, because some of the things that we are modeling and designing for, we don't have the capability to actually test on the ground. Uh, when we talk about hypersonic systems, we talk about space systems, we don't really have the capability to test them before we actually put them in the service. So that's another big challenge area for us. All right, so within the portfolio, we really look at it as, as two-pronged. We do two things. We look at anticipatory research and exploratory research. And when we talk about anticipatory research, we're talking about problems that we already know of today, and we look at new solutions for those types of problems. So we have a quote here from, from General Schwartz from, from 2012, uh, just talking about design and, and, and the concept that we thought we knew how to design an aircraft where it would be perfect the first time it flew. And that's not the case. Um, we, we have all kind of issues when our aircraft come off the manufacturing line. We're not there yet in terms of a design capability. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of our big ideas in that area where we're looking at new solutions potentially to that type of problem in our digital twin arena. Um, so that's, that's one area I'll talk about. And then on the exploratory side, you know, we're really talking about <clears throat> not knowing where we're going to be at 20 years from now not knowing what type of research that we need to fund today to accomplish what we're going to have to do 20 years from now. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some efforts in, our, in my portfolio on the, the big idea is, is, is term shape shifting. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. All right, so digital twin, what is it? Um, the basic concept is moving from the past where we have historically relied on physical testing of our systems in order to qualify them for flight. Uh, moving into the present where we have augmented that with a lot more computational modeling and analysis to help us um, better design and understand what's going to happen with our systems before we put them into the test. But we still use a lot of physical tests to qualify our systems. Um, but those computational models that we're using today are fleet averages of, of our systems. And, and where we're looking at to the future is where we can have digital instantiations of the individual system that we're testing so that we can take into account all the variabilities associated with that particular system. We know they come off the line with, with material variabilities. We know they come off the line with manufacturing variabilities. Um, no two aircraft come off the line you know, manufactured the same way. There's tolerances in, in how they're put together. Um, and that contributes to variances in how they actually perform once they're put into the field. Uh, once they're into the field, we have usage variabilities. No two aircraft are flown the same. They, they experience different amounts of damage. So the idea is that we want a digital 
model of that particular aircraft or that system or that part that takes into account those, those unique characteristics of, of variability so that we can have a better capability to predict when things are going to happen to that aircraft, what its mission capabilities and performance standards are, um, so that we can better design the next generation aircraft as well. So it's really about having a digital twin of that physical model that hopefully in the future will actually reside with the physical system as it flies so they can take that information directly from the non-destructive evaluation from the health monitoring so that it gets updated over time as well as, as the system progresses. So that's the, the general concept of the digital twin. Uh, we're not doing that alone. It's not just a basic research uh, problem. There are certain aspects of that, that that are done today. There are certain aspects of that that uh, can be done on, on a part level. Uh, there's some aspects of that that are being done in the automotive industry. There's aspects of that when, when you talk about, you know, prognostic monitoring, when people are looking at, at just, you know, oil, uh, you know, oil monitoring or, or different things for helicopters. That's a, a small version of a digital twin. We really want to model the system and understand what's happening. So this is actually a, a larger scale um, effort within all of, all of AFRL. Um, and they are actually just kicked off a Spiral 1 uh, 6-2 effort uh, with industry. I believe it was, uh, well, I won't say who it was, who was awarded, so I don't get it wrong, but it just got kicked off, uh, and they'll be looking at, you know, this framework by framework, you know, flight by flight analysis. Yeah. So looking at, at flight by flight analysis, doing the prognosis, supported by local SHM and NDE. But when we talk about what we find within the basic research arena, we're really looking farther out here to the right. We're really looking at, at tail number specific configurations, understanding of variations from materials manufacturing assembly, um, and then bringing in this damage modeling um, into real time so that we can get there. So it's a, it's a large partnership between um, AFRL RQ, AFRL RX, uh, a lot of different groups. Uh, let's see. And so that's, I always look at this, we need one of these maps like we have in the mall. We're here right now, we're just starting. We don't have a timeline on this because this is a long-term vision. This is a long-term goal. We don't know how long this is gonna take for us to achieve. This is at least 20 to 25 years from now, but there are pieces of it that we can do today. So we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing within my program to support uh, the digital twin, uh, specifically on the material side today. All right, so the other question I always get when, when I'm talking to, to, to potential PIs is what material system should I you know, send you for my research? And I always have to come back to them that the structural mechanics program, we're really material agnostic. I don't really care what material system you're using because my focus is on the methodology and the physics and the understanding of how you can better compute stresses, how you can better compute deflections, how you can better compute damage within these material systems. So I'm not really interested in a specific material system, but we understand that people have to select a material system in order to demonstrate what they're actually trying to achieve. So two of the groups at RX um, are, are looking at, at two different types of, of material systems to try to um, bring in that material variability that we're looking at, at modeling within the digital twin. So one group, Mollenhauer, uh, Hall, and Breitzman at RXCC, they're looking at, at polymer matrix composites and really textile polymer matrix composites, uh, looking at the damage evolution. Uh, and then another group there, uh, Mike Yuksich, uh, Paul Shade, and then Demiduk and Woodward are looking at structural alloys um, for turbine engine discs and, and whatnot, but really trying to design from the atomistic scale all the way up to the structural scale. All right, so the first group, Mollenhauer and group, um, what they're really looking at is, is taking experimental capabilities, X-ray, CT, microscopy, um, uh, their, their automated serial sectioning capabilities, and trying to get a better understanding of fiber volume, tow morphology, uh, variation, 
because all of that, when we're manufacturing composites, there's so much variability in each batch of composites that gets manufactured. And when you start talking about textiles and, and orientation of fibers and toes, it gets it gets blown out of blown out of proportion really fast. So they're they're taking that effort on to to try to quantify that from the experimental side and take that into the computational side, uh, all the way down to understanding the effect of resin cure um, and their interface quantification, and they're bringing all of that into this one suite of computational tools uh, for their virtual textile morphology suite is what they, they term it. So they're trying to then simulate all of these different manufacturing processes for these textile PMCs, uh, fiber toes, uh, and, and how you actually um, cure and, 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 and compress these types of, of structures so that you can have an, an estimate of the microscale variations. And then they're comparing that with experiments as well. On the structure side, on the, on the metal side, um, very similar, but they're looking at, at, at microstructures instead of, of toes and, and, and fiber volumes. They're looking at the variations in microstructure um, and how that then scales up in, in a, in a, in a multi-scale fashion to a structural size. So they go from you know, modeling of single grains to modeling of representative volume elements for, for, for a, a collection of grains, all the way up to the actual part. And really try to incorporate these heterogeneities and length and time scales to better understand what's going on in predicting life in these structural alloys. So being able to predict deformation at the meso scale and then translate that up into the, the structural scale as well. Uh, I'm going to skip this one, go to this one. So, and where they bring that together, um, the end goal is not just to be able to compute it at that meso scale, but to translate that into what that actually means in terms of life. Um, because that's, that's where we actually experience, um, that's actually where, where we actually have to work at in the, 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 the systems world when we actually put these systems into place, we're really concerned about how much life do we have, how much life do we have remaining. Um, so understanding how these microstructural models, how the, the models for predicting damage in these cases, how they build up to a probabilistic fatigue model and give us a better opportunity to predict damage uh, and life limiting mechanisms. Uh, all right, so then we talked about updating these models. Um, through SHM and, and, uh, and non-structured evaluation. So try to understand how that fits in the whole scheme of the digital twin as well. Uh, we want to be able to take into account, where are we on here, uh, the damage thresholds, uh, the process uncertainty modeling, um, and then the, the statistics that come out of our, our, our testing and, and the data mining of all of these, this, this physics and engineering knowledge and put that into a framework so that we can um, update our models real time as we move forward. All right. There's a lot of issues still with SHM, uh, a lot of challenges. And where we're going now, uh, where we're going today is moving that also into the computational framework. Trying to understand what type of signals we expect to see in our models before we actually do the SHM on the physical system. So trying to understand the, the theory of how waves propagate through complex materials because they reflect in interfaces, they reflect in our bonds, they reflect in our joints, um, these complexities. Um, there are nonlinearities that are associated with that. Um, and then just to start to understand what, do the effect, what are the effects of the variabilities on the sensing, uh, on what we expect to see on, our, on the sensing side of these SHM signals because the sensitivity uh, to damage varies. Uh, and then so what they're trying to do is make this an inverse problem and really have a better understanding of what the si signal should look like on these systems so they can infer the structural state just from these SHM systems. But again, at the end, at the bottom, you see the, the big issue. This becomes a big computational requirement. So we have a group at the uh, University of South Carolina 
who is, uh, who is trying to look at a little bit of this stuff in terms of, of modeling um, the receiver and transmitters of their, of their PWA systems. I'm not sure if that, this was actually wasn't supposed to play, but they're, they couple that with the FE modeling and their analytical modeling to have a better understanding of what type, uh-oh, well, I just turned everything off, of what the actual system, what actual signals should look like in our, um, in our systems. All right, so let's shift uh, topics. So that, that was one big idea. The other big idea that we're, we're currently funding for our, um, what we think is a, is a big potential return on investment is what I've termed shape shifting. Uh, and so, so the, the big idea, the, 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 the grand idea is to have a system that can change shape radically. Um, and we're really talking futuristic here. So think things like, Terminator 2, where we had the, the liquid metal shape changing capability. Um, if we have the opportunity to, to change shape at a molecular level, we could potentially you know, do some of those type of futuristic things. But we know that this is a step-by-step -step process. So past couple of years, I talked about some of the initial work we did with Diane Bry at University of Michigan on active knits. Uh, we've kind of I've used that as a stepping stone. We've gone to some work now uh, in collaboration with NSF on origami. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the stuff that we're doing there. And then we're really looking at, at, at some, some application side. Um, we've got some, some lab tasks with our space vehicles groups that are looking at how they can use origami to create um, more compact solar arrays um, for, for deploying into space. All right. so. Uh, over the last two years, we've been in an active partnership with the National Science Foundation on one of their EFRI efforts on origami, uh, or, or they termed it Odyssey, the origami design for integration of self-assembling <laughs> systems for engineering innovation. And our key, what we're really interested in from, from Air Force our perspective are how we can combine compliant mechanisms, active materials, and this understanding of folding and microstructures um, to create unprecedented unprecedented uh, deformation in, in our structures. So that was one of the requirements were that they had to address at least two of these areas within their proposals. I think we've co-funded about 13 projects through with, with, uh, with NSF uh, that are currently active. Um, and and we've, we've had a, a very strong partnership with them. And we got a good leveraging on our, our money um, uh, for, for what, what they've put in. So we all know what origami is, the ancient art of paper folding from, from, uh, that originated from Japan, but it's really being uh, brought into the, into the fields of structure um, in today. So, so it's coming into to map folding, it's being coming into, into play into, into art and design, um, and, and, now, and, and we even see it in, in certain aspects of nature. So one of the groups out of uh, Penn State that's funded, Mary Frecker, uh, is really looking at how we can put together a, a design approach for origami engineering. Uh, so they start with by just identifying, you know, what type of mechanisms do we need to have happen in our system? Take that, extracting that to a different, uh, to a base mechanism, creating mathematical models to, to model what type of, of deformation mechanisms we, we expect, and then they adapt it to other materials and thicknesses because Technically, origami is, is paper folding, and it's, it's, it's the, the theory is based on an infinite thinness of, 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 of structure, no thickness to the structure. But our structures have thickness, so we have to be able to adapt to, to this thickness and, and change the theory, the, adapt from the theory of the traditional origami, um, and then integrate it into our applications. So one group that's doing that um, is at BYU, Spencer Magleby uh, and crew, they're really looking at, is that me? Uh, really looking at, at understanding, modeling the paper folds as mechanisms. So they, they look at them as, um, uh, as hinges, as, uh, I can't read all of these on here, trees, uh, croquets, uh, and really trying to understand, trying to model the design the overall design of the folded structure through a, very, through a, through a series of mechanisms. Uh, and they're also starting to look at 
at different things. When we talked about additive manufacturing and, 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 and laser cutting, um, when we talk about folds in structures and, and shift adapting beyond what we're talking about in terms of paper, we may not be able to just do a traditional fold. So we may actually have to look at, at modifying the theory to allow for cutting, uh, allow for slitting and in terms of paper and in terms of teaming. So we have, have one type of material here, same type of material just using a series of cuts. We can get all kinds of different types of, of, of compliance in the structure. So same type of structure, but just by understanding what type of cuts we can place, we can generate uh, a lot of different types of uh, deformation mechanisms or capability within the same structural system. All right, and we talked about abstracting it uh, because we are dealing with infinite thickness, I mean, with, 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 with zero thickness structure. So how do we handle thickness in, in origami panels? Um, we have another group, uh, I think this is also the BYU group, that's looking at um, placement of hinges, um, understanding how we can, can abstract the theory of origami to account for finite thickness in these structures and still achieve compact designs. Uh, so where are we going with all of this? Um, the idea with the, the from the, the, the additive manufacturing to the folding to uh, being able to create structure, got a group out of this, this group uh, between MIT and Harvard that are really looking at, at 3D printing on paper of structure. You can see the 3D printer going there. Go ahead and click the next one. Um, and then once this paper comes out, they actually have this fold design already printed on the paper. It's folded in hand. We don't typically fold that fast, but <laughs> it can be, can be folded by a person. Go to the next one. And then with the standard electronics kit, they put this together and you've got a working quadcopter from a paper folded design. All right, go to the next one. Oh, I guess I get to do the next one. All right, so this is the work that that, that group at MIT and Harvard have done, uh, and you can see the commercially available quadcopter, and their their paper folded quadcopter, and then some comparisons of uh, of the performance. And I think the the key one that we want to look at is down here, in terms of cost. <laughs> <laughs> They're able to, to create one of these quadcopters that, that's forty dollars versus four thousand. So, how, if we have this printing on demand capability in the field, you know what type of how can that change how we look at our conops of, of surveillance, of reconnaissance, of you know being able to deploy systems on demand. Um, actually in the field. So this is actually some of the work that we're going to be doing with the Virginia Tech group. Um, they're going to be um, doing the additive manufacturing. So it won't be folding, but it'll be additive manufacturing, you know, piece by piece buildup of ground vehicles and air vehicles. They've done the same, same similar thing with the quadcopter. Uh, and we're going to put them through some, some design challenges uh, for that as well. And with that, I'm going to end early, I believe. So to summarize, um, there are three, thor three core thrusts within the structural mechanics portfolio. And all of it has kind of integrated around this vision for the digital twin. Uh, we've expanded that to, to this next area of shape shifting. But we really look at anticipatory and exploratory research uh, for novel flight structures, multi-scale modeling prognosis, structural dynamics, uh, with the focus on computing, predicting, and enabling the future for the Air Force. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. No questions. Fair not. Very nice presentation, some interesting things. Uh, uh, in the area of non-destructive evaluation, what kind of tools have you developed tools or do you just basically look at various structures? Yeah, from, from the basic research side, we really don't look at developing tools. Um, the, 
and actually that, that's been a key area we've been working with with RX on identifying what are the fundamental basic research challenges associated with non-destructive evaluation. And right now, one of the, the, the main ones is moving into the nonlinear side, going into nonlinear ultrasonics and understanding how the, the ultrasonic waves are propagating through the structure um, when we're actually dealing with nonlinear aspects of it. So moving it beyond the linear ultrasonics testing and going into nonlinear. But we don't look at developing devices or anything like that. So it's really the theory. So another question? Yeah, yeah uh, again, re really great uh, presentation. The uh, digital twin idea uh, is something that we at Air Mobility Command have been interested in yep. for quite some time. Uh, in addition to just looking at, you know, what would happen, uh, I mean, when you do a block upgrade, how is this going to change the aircraft? Uh, we'd like that capability to help us with what-ifs, analysis yep. of alternatives and stuff like that, so that we can actually model and, and look at those kinds of things. Yep, yep. and, and that, that's one of the things that I think can actually can be done today. Um, or or with, with, some, with some work, I think we're a lot closer to, to that aspect of, of being able to do the what if scenario. Um, it doesn't take into account all of the material variability and the other variability, but we had some work at Seek Eagle looking at, at store configurations and, and what happens, you know, being able to certify stores um, more rapidly, you know, changing out stores on F-16, how do we qualify, what, what actually, what flight test do we have to do to actually qualify this. Um, so I think there are some stuff that we could do um, in terms of, of looking at, at block upgrades and, and being able to do the what-if scenarios on the mission planning side. Good, thank you. Well, it's just an observation. It's very nice for the, the printing of the structure because you can print the strain gauges in there. It's not like 40 years ago when I had to paste them on. Yep. And then with some of the magno-resistive uh, materials, if you print those on, put a, a current to them, then you can get your shape shifting and, yep. and change your stiffness. So I think there's a... Yeah, all of those areas are starting to dovetail into 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 one. You know, we have have multiple streams that that start finding a, a single vision. I think it's going to be a key area. So so that's going to be an enabler for the morphing side. Um, the embedded sensors is going to be a a, a, a real. Um, uh, you know, we have people already doing you know embedded circuits and and, and things like that. I think that's going to be the next wave of of advancement. Yep, and the added manufacturing allows to do that. Yes. This is I think a very promising area. Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time. And he will uh, be discussing turbulence and transition.